What gives the vanguard artist and the autocrat their special affinity is awareness of the world's plasticity. This is what emboldens them to ignore the masses and fashion a new world, a new people. But if Boris Groy's artist ruler calls to us across the historical chasm between Stalin's Soviet Union and Ho Tsu Nien's Singapore, it is for his determination to take at face value the total aesthetico-political project, a bureaucratic monopolization of art like that of 21st century Singapore. And for this figure of authorship distinct from the one that prevails in most white North Atlantic histories of modern art, one that is arguably less individualist, whose agency and autonomy are not those of the creative citizen, much less of the visionary outsider, but derive instead from identification with the political whole, as embodied by a sovereign or the curatorial state. Like all Singapore's artists, Ho Tzu Nien operates much of the time under just such an aesthetico-political monopoly. But that should not deter us from taking the artist seriously. Rather, it should be assumed that their work, however original or critical, is at the same time legible as a writing of the state. While through and through a creature of the nation, Ho is not fashioning for it a new people. This hardly discharges his Faustian bargain, but it does open a certain distance, an interval defining the range of art's instrumentality. His secondment to the sovereign might at least vouchsafe some sovereignty for art. However thickly populated, Ho's rendition of 21st century Singapore may be a portrait of a nation, but it is in no sense a portrait of a people, much less of the people. Every figure in his abidingly figurative oeuvre is either a name, a historical personage at least half mythical, or they are nameless, unbranded automata the any person whatever. In both cases, they are neither subjects nor protagonists of the historical nation, but rather generic, timeless avatars of an abstract humanity, even when plainly situated in the contemporary island republic. Even at its most mythical, oniric, or philosophical, Ho's work can be situated somewhere. But that somewhere is never a discrete, politically grounded site like a country. His oeuvre is set in a region, not the Southeast Asia reified during the Cold War by the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, but an idea of region, one that suffers from a lack of substance. A byproduct of colonial and imperial military adventures with no pre existing political, cultural, or geographical cohesion, Southeast Asia was conceived outside of Southeast Asia. Though its populations have lately begun to take ownership of that abstraction, historically they were mixed and mobile, resistant to territorial fixity. Their rubbery cultures hardly offer the analyst firmer ground. Southeast Asia is less a place than a state of perpetual emergence. That fuzziness is integral to the region's historical constitution, and it has its advantages. A sprawling domain of unfathomable cultural diversity, a transit zone marked by the sweep of ancient trade routes where two monsoons meet a layered, syncretic social matrix 
where the great faiths took root in already rich spiritual soil. Clichés they may be, but they are all true. And in the absence of any more concrete unity, that litany makes the region what it is and guarantees its conceptual plasticity. However chimerical, Southeast Asia has been Ho's most faithful companion and muse, a constant horizon, a lens yielding insights into a larger Asia and a wider world that are not apparent from elsewhere. He reads Southeast Asian area studies against the grain of its master dialectic, the tension between native traditions and national modernities that also governed the interpretation of Southeast Asian art after the Cold War. He steered clear of the critique and ironic complication of national identity, nor does he entertain questions often posed by scholars and curators alike about a modernity that unites the region. For it is Southeast Asia's very disunity, its elusive and uncomposed character, that makes it such an apt setting in this age of deterritorializing capital, of political decentering and faltering regionalism, of disintegrating spheres of power and influence. For Ho Tzu Nien, the region provides that larger cosmological configuration and an obverse history, one whose subjects are not people or peoples, but media. Ho's idiosyncratic regionalism finds its apogee in the oxymoron of a critical dictionary of Southeast Asia. With its unpredictable morphology, miscellany of sources and proliferating lines of flight, the dictionary could almost be a synopsis for his always recursive practice as a whole. It's hard to say what is research and what is work, or where the work ends and the framing begins. Harder still, to imagine an end for this difference engine, performing a perpetual ouverture, like the artist's signature mise en abîme, curtains drawn to reveal curtains. The dictionary is a self-governing generative assemblage. Its website composes a new iteration with each viewing, according to an algorithm, endlessly drawing out new connections amongst a heterogeneous audiovisual database, a paranoid method. Yet its surrealism is not of the brand managed by Breton, but more in the Nietzschean spirit of Bataille's critical dictionary and the legendary short-lived review that carried it, Document, memorably described by James Clifford as a playful museum that simultaneously collects and reclassifies its specimens. Even more fitting is another phrase coined for that same journal. Montage figuratif. But if Ho's dictionary inherits something of Bataille's insolent arbitrariness, its program has more in common with the later entropic play that attended liberal capitalism's apotheosis and the death of the author. Few artists in Southeast Asia better fit the epithet postmodernist. Suspicious of all master narratives, Reiteration and repetition are like ticks in Ho's oeuvre. Motifs and figures return like ghosts, like stuttering speech in an unmastered language of command. Every work is intertextual, marked by art historical self-consciousness, pastiche and subversive fabulation. Yet he breaks the postmodern mould in one decisive sense. Postmodernism founded due to its dependence on modernity, the discourse whose expiry it announced. But in Southeast Asia, no such expiry was ever on the cards. Uneven and incomplete, modernity has remained this region's motive principle, the bottom line of all historical accounting. So what precedes modernity or impedes it is more important than what might come after it. Indeed, the faltering progress of a certain universal reason reveals older, slower, quieter transformations.
The march of European reason in Southeast Asia, from the founding of the first university in 17th century Manila through the end of the Cold War, was more like a slow crawl. But this enlightenment was not the region's first. Two great monsoonal fronts had already brought integration into a vast Sanskrit cosmopolis and the tributary web of the Middle Kingdom as early as the 5th century CE. Trade drove waves of innovation across Mandala Southeast Asia, with its rice-based valley states and their fluctuating spheres of influence. Compared with later, more violent waves, European imperialism in the 19th century, American and Japanese in the 20th, these earlier ones left a more enduring legacy, a dynamic, heterological fabric of exchange, both political and cultural, which may have been coercive and brutish, but was not, for a thousand years, colonial. The region's syncretic cultures are products of accommodation more than subjugation, of mixture, unforced conversion, and often peaceable coexistence. As James C. Scott notes, the early states were polyglot melange of migrant populations from near and far, trading goods, skills, languages, and beliefs, of corvée labor uprooted and seconded through war, of mercenaries, traders, pilgrims, and fugitives. Statecraft was the control of this walking miscellany, not of territory, which was abundant and largely there for the taking. So exclusion never made political sense. Tolerance and the absorption of difference were paramount, though some, of course, still preferred to keep their distance. Would you agree that relations between artists and the state um, could have something to tell us regionally or not? Yeah, I think we, we have to see the state form, you know, the form of the state uh, in, in Southeast Asia as something, I would say, uh, of a different trajectory than how it might be understood, for example, in, in Europe, you know. Uh, this is simply, you know, because of the very different trajectories of our, of our history, right? I think through the 19th uh, century, right? And, you know, thinking about like artists, you know, who, who are kind of like involved in plastic arts, you know, and thinking about the state, it, the, the, the term that I think you used in your essay was also like uh, about plasticity, which is interesting, right? Like, you know, to think about plasticity is also to think of the possibility of um, transforming something. So I would say that, you know, when we engage with the state, we also um, have the notion, perhaps it's a delusion, that we would be able at some level to transform the way the state functions, you know. So this engagement, I would say, um, you know, contrary to like my first answer about like, you know, that the relationship with the state came, was uh, predominantly one of like applying for funds and, you know, administration. I, I would say that there is also a certain kind of a artistic task involved, which is, which is how we could transform how it works, right? Through our interactions, uh, with individuals who work for the state or who work with the state, right? And of course, you know, it's, it's also a kind of very familiar tale that very often, if one tries to change something from within, one, the only thing that gets changed is yourself, right? Like, and you know, the system doesn't change. So that's, you know, for me, an ever present, uh, you know, recognition that, that this danger, um, you know, is there. And I would say, 
you know, engagement with the state has to be situational. It has to be strategic. Uh, one has to unplug or to know when to unplug, just as one has to know uh, which are the moments in which uh, one can push through, uh, try to push through something at least, you know. So, um, you know, I, uh, Southeast Asian scholar, I think he's a scholar of Southeast Asia, I think he's Australian, uh, called, he's called Tony Day, right? He wrote a book which has an interesting title, which I wanted to bring up like, in relation to your question, which is Fluid Iron State Formation in Southeast Asia. So basically he describes the state as, uh, as iron, which is fluid, right? So iron in the sense that you feel this, uh, you know, heaviness, force, but at the same time, it's fluid. So there is that possibility of, uh, of transforming, uh, changing it from within. But thinking about fluid, iron, you know, I always brings to my mind the process of like casting, right? For example, uh, you know, bronze casting, which, uh, you know, very nicely kind of brings us actually to, to, to the title of the book that we have, which is G for Gong. You know, Gongs, you know, appeared in Southeast Asia uh, in, in the late Bronze Age. Uh, and they were, of course, made out of this process of casting, right? like we, where you have something uh, fluid, something which is liquid, which uh, solidifies, uh, you know, and most of the musical instruments uh, in, in Southeast Asia were either made of bamboo or, or gongs or, or bronze, I mean. And why I bring this up as well is that, you know, in the late bronze age, uh, sort of early iron age, when, when this technique of bronze casting first becomes available, uh, it, it was actually quite open as in uh, anyone can assess this technology quite easily, right? But after some time, this technology, this technique of bronze casting becomes a specialized activity, uh, which only the elite class, and so this is like in Bronze Age, South, Southeast Asia, just like 2000 plus, 3000 years ago, right? So only the elite class could uh, afford, you know, the surplus manpower and resources you need to create uh, bronze instruments like gongs, right? So certain archeologists have, you know, discovered that the emergence of uh, bronze instruments actually came together with the emergence of uh, state-like structures, you know, in Southeast Asia. So the social becomes stratified uh, just as, uh, you know, gong, uh, bronze instruments uh, became in circulation. And this is why many uh, sort of pre-colonial Southeast Asian uh, uh, royal courts, right? They are, their music are all sort of uh, bronze, bronze orchestras. Right? So bronze has uh, sort of remained a kind of uh, uh, courtly music, you know? So, yeah, so this is, uh, but what has been cast sort of fixed in stone can always be melted down and, and transformed into something else, right? So that I would say is, uh, you know, still part of our, uh, you know, hope with uh, engaging uh, the systems.